We'll be starting in about one minute. Okay, welcome everybody. I'm Jim Cahill and I'm here today with Greg McMillan for today's live process control seminar and demo series. And we call these Deminars for short. Today's topic is PID tuning for self-regulating processes. This broadcast is being recorded and will be available for future viewing. We'll be muting all but Greg's microphone, so please use the Q&A box to ask your questions of Greg, and I'll be monitoring it, and I'll relay the questions verbally to Greg during the course of today's session. And we'd like these to be as interactive as possible, so please ask your questions as they occur. With that, I'll turn it over to Greg. Okay, thank you for joining us. Uh, these uh, seminars were sponsored by Emerson Experia Tech and Minor, and uh, they were created by me and Jack Ayler. So I uh, had a 33-year career with Monsanto and Solutia, and I knew Jack Ayler's there. He's a uh, control specialist at Monsanto, and we've been working together to create the Process Control Lab website, which is now available. Uh, and the website itself, uh, the design, and it was by Charlie Schleiser of CS Design Co. And you can uh, check him out on his website. Uh, this is me. Uh, I like to uh, share a lot of what I've learned. And uh, for the last four years, I've been doing that with over 150 entries on my modeling and control website. I'm kind of known for my top ten list, so we'll start out with one. I've uh, witnessed uh, one startup about 15 years ago on a new product that was almost like this. Uh, it was the uh, uh, first attempt uh, to uh, make an innovative new product, and they didn't do uh, testing of a control system with simulations. Uh, they just thought uh, it would all work right. Well, um, it went one go quite that way. And so here's the top ten signs a startup is uh, going wrong. Product tanks are empty. Waste tanks are full. Not a good sign. The startup team and the DCS has negative three ton. The entire design team is in the control room. The whole research group is in the control room. The managers have left the control room. We kind of notice managers show up when things are going well. When things are not going well, um, they'd rather not be a party to what's happening. The consoles are lit up like a pinball machine. Operators keel over from donut overdose. A collection is taken for the startup budget. And the number one sign, the order for souvenir baseball caps is canceled. Well, today we're going to look at the tuning for self-regulating processes, and that's the most common type of uh, process out there simply because we've got more flow loops than any other type of uh, control loop, and a flow loop is a self-regulating process. Other examples would be uh, liquid pressure, uh, continuous heat exchanger control, uh, continuous temperature control uh, of, uh, of any type, whether it's in a column or in a vessel, except when you get into um, those types of process equipment, the process response is so slow, we start to talk about them being near integrating, even though um, they officially or theoretically 
uh, that you're self-regulating. So for very slow processes, uh, that's what we're going to talk about in the next seminar. How can we uh, do a much faster job of uh, analyzing and tuning them? But today we're going to look at the fast self-regulating processes. And uh, the, the thing about a self-regulating process is that if you uh, have the controller in manual uh, and make a, a step change in the controller output, uh, it'll reach a, a new steady state value, uh, provided that there isn't another disturbance going on. And the fact that it does line out at a new uh, operating point on its own with the controller in manual without any feedback control means there is a self-regulating uh, uh, behavior to the process. And of course, you can understand this for flow loops. If you put the flow loop in manual and you make a change in controller output, uh, provided uh, that there isn't any disturbance right then, it'll go to a new flow. It may not be what you want, but it will line out a new flow. Uh, this plot here is in terms of percent uh, control variable and percent controller output because the PID algorithm works in percent, even though what you see on the interface and even in configuration is uh, the process variable in engineering units and possibly the controller output in engineering units. The PID algorithm works in terms of percent the scale of these signals, so you need to be mindful of that in any tuning calculations that you might do manually or just to understand what's going on in terms of uh, calculations that are being done automatically for you. And we describe the self-regulating response by a uh, process gain and it's the percent change in uh, the control variable after it's lined out divided by uh, the step change it made in the controller output. And notice uh, that the uh, units are percent for percent because again the algorithm uh, works in percent and uh, so they cancel out and it's actually a dimensionless process gain. Um, there's two other parameters. Uh, one is the observed uh, process dead time and after you make uh, the change in controller output there is a period of time when there response is not distinguishable from noise and maybe within a noise band. Once it gets out of that noise band, uh, that's the end of the dead time. And so this total dead time can come uh, from any part in the control loop. We say it's a process dead time, but it could be due to uh, pre-stroke dead time in the control valve. Uh, it could be due to um, sample uh, or refresh times and uh, wireless measurements, it could be due to transportation delays and cycle times and analyzers. And, and actually what it turns out uh, as we get further into these seminars that any small time constants uh, uh, can be effectively looked as contributing to the dead time. And this approximation here of the self-regulating process, uh, first order approximation, which means that we are going to uh, describe the behavior in terms of a single process time constant. Now the process time constant we start to measure right after the process has started to change here and then we know when it has reached 63 percent of its final value. Of course you have to know what the final value is so you wait till it reaches its final value and then at the 63 percent point is uh, about where the inflection point is where the instead of the slope increasing, it's now decreasing, and uh, that marks uh, the end of the process time constant, and so you can get an estimate manually that way. There's also things you can do in terms of drawing tangent lines and other approximation methods uh, that would uh, also provide you with an estimate of the process time constant, which is used to describe the exponential response of the process once it gets out of the dead time. Normally we think of level as being integrating, not at ramps. Um, but in this case, uh, in the uh, clinical tank in the MIT Anna University lab in India, it, it, it turned out that we had a self-regulating response and a nonlinear one. Uh, we studied this uh, and used adaptive control to, to deal with the nonlinearities. And we did it on a self-regulating basis. If you want to get into the details of uh, how we 
analyze this process uh, as being self-regulating instead of integrating. And, and what we were able to do to improve the performance, you can check out this article uh, on the website for Control Global, which is a controlling magazine. But we'll go over the highlights of uh, the results. Uh, this gives you a detail of clinical tank, and uh, the important aspects uh, of it is that there is a, a hand valve, not a pump on the discharge. So the flow through the, this discharge valve depends upon uh, the liquid head. Uh, in other words, the pressure drop created by the liquid head. So as uh, the liquid head or the level goes higher, we're going to have more pressure drop across the control valve, and we're going to have more flow through the control valve. This provides the self-regulating action. In other words, without a controller, provided the clinical tank is large enough uh, for the disturbance coming in, which is set by uh, a variable speed pump, um, the, the, the level will reach a, a new operating point. However, there's also a linearity uh, beside the one associated with the uh, with the square root of the pressure drop uh, offered by the liquid head across the exit valve to determine the discharge flow, there's an increase in uh, cross-sectional area with level. And this increases the process time constant as uh, the level goes up, making the process response slower. Um, perhaps more important uh, to deal with is the, is the converse situation at uh, very low levels, uh, we have a very small cross-sectional gain, a cross-sectional area, which uh, provides a, a very uh, small process time constant. It makes the process response uh, very fast. And if you use the same tuning that you had for the slower uh, process response, you're going to get into excessive oscillations. And that's what we show here. At low levels, where we make set point changes at low levels. Uh, we finally get into a very oscillatory response because this was tuned for higher levels. And as we uh, go up an operating level and make set point changes at uh, successively higher levels, uh, we find that the oscillations go away. And finally up here, you know, we're, we've got some overshoot. This controller is not tuned perfectly, um, but this just gives you the relative idea of the stability of the control system and the fact that uh, at low levels uh, you're going to get into oscillatory uh, and uh, approach uh, some maybe some stability problems. We applied adaptive controller to it and it identified uh, the process gain uh, and it, it shows that there is a, a slight increase in, in process gain uh, with level, and that's uh, due to the fact that the available pressure drop uh, across the exit valve has increased. Uh, more importantly, though, is the uh, fact that the time constant is dramatically increasing as we increase the level. And if we uh, zoom in on that here, kind of freeze things and zoom in, uh, we can we can see that uh, the process gain is. Uh, Close to, close to zero in uh, region one. Um, and then if we move into region five, uh, where say the set point is around 90% in the middle of that region, uh, we find uh, that the process gain is, uh, or excuse me, the time constant, uh, I apologize, the time constant is about uh, uh, getting close to uh, 240 seconds. So again, um, if, if we look at region one here, uh, the, the time constant is close to, close to zero. And if we get into a region five here, uh, the time constant is uh, close to about 240. So it's had a dramatic increase in, in the time constant causing uh, the behavior we see in terms of uh, um, uh, stability problems as the time constant goes towards zero. So we applied the adaptive control based on the dynamics identified for those five regions, and we get about the same response, and certainly a very nice smooth response at low levels, and pretty consistently then as we move up into higher levels, and 
in general, it uh, looks better throughout the whole operating range uh, than it did with uh, the controller that had uh, the fixed uh, tuning settings. Now, to get to the adaptive controller, you can uh, you can go to the detail display by clicking on the magnifying glass, and then there'll be the icon for the adaptive uh, controller. Also, it has an auto tuner in it, or you can go directly to it from the faceplate. And, uh, these faceplates uh, and details uh, displays are here that are shown on what in the process control lab. Uh, the first uh, loop we're going to look at is liquid flow, and the principal nonlinearity is caused by the equal percentage characteristic. And here the slope is essentially the valve gain. And if there's no other nonlinearities in the loop, uh, essentially the valve gain is determined the process gain. So at uh, low valve travels, uh, low controller outputs, so we have a relatively flat slope. We have a low valve gain, therefore a low process gain. At, uh, at steep slopes here, as uh, we get into uh, higher, the high strokes and the higher uh, outputs of the flow controller, we end up uh, with the steep slope, a high valve gain, and therefore a high process gain. Uh, the equal percentage characteristic is probably the most popular characteristic for a wide variety of reasons because uh, one of the things is as the, as the pressure drop varies, uh, this is going to move a little bit to more towards the linear situation. And uh, also, it, it, we're most interested in one of the problems at the seat in terms of stick slip uh, as a percent of the, of the you know, total valve stroke. Uh, what the effect is on the process. And so for a given amount of stick slip, which is actually the greatest in the seat, it translates due to the flatness and, and actually the low flow here to a smaller flow uh, change or a flow problem associated with stick slip. So equal percentage and does a lot better in process control loops and, uh, in general, and so that's why it's the most popular characteristic. Uh, here in the process control lab, we have created the equal percentage characteristic um, by entering the percent of maximum flow from the previous graph of the equal percentage characteristic, and uh, we enter that in for 5% increments of stroke. Um, what's neat about this table is it doesn't have to be that theoretical characteristic. You can get uh, an installed characteristic, which uh, could be a printout from a valve sizing program that takes into account your system, um, piping, and pumps, and, and uh, you can end up then with uh, you know a, a, a custom um, set of numbers here that you could uh, enter in as uh, your particular installed valve uh, characteristic. So it gives you a lot of flexibility. Here we're showing uh, the auto tuner, and it's called an on-demand tuner. And you get to it, um, well, if you click on the faceplate icon, you're going to get to it automatically. Once you're in it, if you click on the different PID controllers uh, or the PID tags, uh, and then you, uh, if you not, happen not to be in the tune, the tune set of screens, if you click on this uh, tune here, you'll, you'll come up with these uh, set of screens here. Uh, and here we're showing the use of the on-demand or auto tuner, and um, it's got a lot of other capability as uh, indicated by the tabs here. Um, you can do adaptive tuning uh, by clicking on the adaptive tuning tab, and that automatically identifies dynamics from uh, set point and main output changes, or if you don't have any of those going, uh, from an automatically injected pulse. If, if you want more information on this, you can see the Emerson Exchange 2009 presentation on Delta V inside for the monitoring control. Uh, then you can go to adaptive control, you can look at your models, uh, you can review the learning setup and simulate. Um, uh, if you're in adaptive control, it's going to automatically identify the dynamics in each region. Here uh, I'm showing you can set up five regions, and uh, uh, what we've got. Uh, identified here is uh, the process gain and how it's affected by the equal percentage characteristic. And, um, 
For a theoretical equal percentage characteristic, the, uh, the process gain is approximately proportional to flow. Um, well, if you have a you know, varying pressure drop and um, that's significant, then this wouldn't be quite true for the, for the install characteristic. But it gives you an idea of the significant change uh, in process gain that we're going to get. And uh, if we zoom in here on uh, the process gain, uh, we'll see that it starts out to be uh, close to zero due to the flat part of uh, the equal percentage characteristic at, at uh, low controller outputs in region one. And then in uh, region five, um, it's uh, gone up uh, to over a factor of, uh, of two. So uh, there's been a significant change uh, here in uh, the process gain and due to the control valve uh, characteristic. On the learning setup screen, we've got the ability to set the triggers. Uh, if we don't have any set point or output changes as triggers, we can inject automatically a pulse, but we can uh, set the parameters associated with that so we can minimize the disruption to the process. We can set the search for the right uh, dynamics uh, by uh, the adaptive identification algorithm. We can set the basic type of process whether it's integrating, and then uh, if it's integrating or self-regulating, there are some things like uh, for self-regulating, as uh, shown here, time to a steady state. Uh, you can change that. It comes up initialized uh, based on the current tuning. Um, and uh, you can also um, initialize. If you don't like where you're at, uh, you can initialize back to a default uh, setting here. Um, one thing that people may not realize is that uh, the identification uh, stops if you get too close to an output limit because things can get very strange. Either, either due to, uh, like if for the control valves, due to a very flat characteristic or a stick slip or a backlash, which is noticeably larger, typically near the pose position. And the fault here is 5%, but uh, if you have a good sliding stem valve with a digital positioner and uh, you've minimized stick slip and, uh, and backlash to be significantly less than 1%, you can change this from the default of 1%, uh, 5% to the 1% as uh, shown here. And uh, we'll zoom in on that. Uh, and, and that that allows you to uh, identify process models uh, close to your operating limits because you may be operating at times, uh, say during startup or low demand or due to uh, control valve sizing, uh, you may be operating near the low limit or as the plant capacity increases, and this happened quite a bit in the 1990s, you may be operating uh, close to the high limit. Then in the simulate screen, uh, you can uh, look at the gain and phase margin if you're into a frequency response. Uh, or if you're more like me and you're into the time response, so uh, you can check out uh, the, uh, the trend chart response uh, for uh, set point changes or for disturbances um, based on uh, settings. Now, uh, what comes up is a, a recommended setting based on the identified uh, tuning, of course, you have control over that in terms of whether you want that tuning to be faster or slower. But based on what you chose as being uh, the tuning with the uh, identification having been done for the process, uh, you, it then comes up with a recommended setting. We'll kind of zoom in on that. and, and and see that it then also displays the, the, the tuning that's uh, recommended versus what's in the controller, and you can update that. Uh, it also tells you what tuning method you've selected and what the structure is of the PID uh, that you selected, and also on a, a dead time margin. Now, if you want to see what happens if you try a different tuning, if you click anywhere in that green band, 
it will give you the tuning setting and also it will give you the set point or, or the disturbance uh, response. So you can try out uh, different tunings there relative to what was recommended and get an idea of uh, what's going on. Well, let's uh, get into using the process control lab. And uh, we'll show adaptive control of a fast, nonlinear self regulating process. And so for us today, that's uh, liquid flow, liquid pressure. These are the most common types of fast, nonlinear self regulating processes. We're going to start out with uh, the liquid flow loop, but we're going to show how we enter the nonlinear control valve characteristic into the process control lab. We're going to run the auto tuner and we're going to select particular factors, uh, Ziegler Nichols factors, uh, based on uh, some knowledge of the type of loop that we have and what we're trying to do. Then uh, we're going to run the adaptive tuner and uh, see what it uh, comes up with. Uh, we'll, uh, with these fixed tuning settings, uh, that we have in the controller um, with the adaptive mode off, we're going to make uh, set point changes in region 5 where the uh, slope of the uh, valve characteristic is very steep, the process gain is high. Then we'll move into region 1 where the slope of the valve uh, characteristic is flat and the process gain is low. Uh, the responses, is, since we're, we'll have been tuned for the High process gain, we're going to find that we have a kind of a slow response here uh, for the low process gain. And so we will take that opportunity while we're waiting for the response to uh, review uh, the adaptive control screen, model viewing screen, the learning setup screen, the simulate screen. And after that, we'll switch uh, to the adaptive uh, partial mode uh, and, and see how much better we can do with adaptive control and we'll make set point changes in uh, region 1 and 5. Um, then we'll do the same thing for the liquid uh, pressure loop, but here uh, we will have created a non-linear process game uh, based on, uh, say, uh, what might be a typical pump curve. And now it's kind of a, the opposite in terms of uh, what, you, what you saw in the flow loop, in that for a low, uh, uh, low pressure set points, uh, we're going to be on a steep part of the pump curve, and so the high process came. And uh, for high pressure set points, uh, we're going to be moving on to the flat part of the pump curve, and uh, we're going to get into uh, low process games. And we're going to repeat the tuner and adaptive control runs, and, uh, and uh, make uh, adaptive mode tests, and then go to partial depth, uh, like we did for the liquid flow so, let's go to my desktop and uh, let's get that going. Okay. Uh, I, didn't, I guess the, I forgot to share the desktop. Uh, okay. I forgot to share the desktop. Now we should be okay. Here's uh, the process control lab where uh, we can make these runs. Uh, once you get into the process control lab, you're going to see this uh, operate screen. And we're going to start out with the uh, liquid flow loop. So we'll go to cascade control where the secondary controller has dynamics uh, similar to a liquid flow loop. And uh, we can check out um, the nonlinearity here that we've created in the control valve characteristic by going to the control valve tag and then looking at these um, percent maximum flow values that we entered based on uh, the equal percentage uh, characteristic. Now we want to go to uh, the auto tuner and adaptive uh, control uh, tool. So we click on uh, the icon on there and uh, we're in uh, the uh, adaptive tuning. Let's go to the on-demand tuning, and this is the auto tuner. Um, and we'll see uh, what kind of uh, controller settings we get out of this. We'll use the default step size of uh, 3% and start a test.
Now, the auto tuner uses a relay oscillation method uh, developed by Carl Ostrom, and it's very uh, effective at giving you uh, some reasonable tuning values relatively quickly. Uh, now, if you had a, a large process time constant, uh, the filtering effect of that would be such that you may not see much of a oscillation in the process variable, and, and uh, that's good because uh, that means you have made uh, the disruption to the process uh, almost perhaps negligible and imperceptible. But for a flow loop where the process time constant is, uh, is small because it's such a fast loop, we are going to see a very noticeable uh, oscillation in the process variable, and we can control that by uh, the step size. So here we've come up with some tuning settings, and since the relay oscillation method is uh, really giving you a good uh, estimate of the ultimate gain and ultimate period, um, I like to use the, the Ziegler Nichols closed loop method, which is based on the ultimate period, uh, to take advantage of the fact that now we have good values for that. However, I uh, tend to use less of a a gain that would be recommended and so on. This is already less than what you get for a uh, closed loop uh, uh, tuning as documented originally by Zero Nichols. And it's kind of interesting, a lot of the tests out there uh, of Zero Nichols used the original factors by Zero Nichols, which was a maximized for load rejection, but didn't have much stability, so they just count the, the whole method. Really, all, all they needed to do was to reduce the gain, and this effectively is cutting the, the recommended Ziegler Nichols factor by uh, in half. Uh, normally Ziegler Nichols factor would be, I think, uh, like a 0.4 or something like that. And then people get hung up on a second significant digit, and things change in a process, whether it's due to the nonlinear valve, or the nonlinear process, uh, due to time and operating point. Uh, so getting too carried away with uh, the two significant digits, you're uh, is uh, kind of meaningless. So it's important in simulations, and that's where people get carried away with it. Uh, here I'm going to, knowing that this is approaching a dead time down in the process, I'm going to go with also uh, a lower factor for reset time. And if we look here then at the settings, and let's see if we can zoom in the recommended settings. So, now we see that uh, we've got a gain of 0 0.39 versus uh, the current gain in the controller 0.2, a reset time of 3.3 seconds versus the current reset time of 2 seconds. And uh, I'm sure there would be some benefits here for load response rejection, but you know, if you were this close, um, uh, you probably don't need to, there's more important things probably for you to be working on. And, uh, it's only in simulations that we really get hung up on on, uh, you know, getting exactly right and being engineers, that tends to be uh, uh, operation. Uh, so let's go to adaptive control, uh, adaptive tuning, but let's uh, check the learning setup and make sure that we are going to uh, trigger uh, adaptation, identification of the dynamics based on set point change. And here I've uh, uh, chosen 2%. So we'll go to the adaptive tuning screen. And uh, we can make a set point change here, right, from adaptive tuning, but it would be better in general if you made it uh, from, you know, the faceplate and, uh, and therefore the operator uh, was more of the, uh, so uh, I'm doing that here. I'm changing uh, the set point of flow loop, uh, the secondary loop in this uh, cascade control system. Let me go back to here, and you notice that, yeah, it does show the set points changed. Uh, and uh, it says we have triggered the identification. Now it's uh, waiting uh, based on its identified time for steady state for valid data. And uh, we'll see if uh, what type of uh, model it comes up with. Right now it's uh, process gain of 1.3, a time constant of 2.9, and a dead time of 1.3. And if we go to model viewing, uh, we can see uh, that, uh, yes, uh, we do have a new model here. It's uh, come up with uh, basically the same values as the last model. That's, that's good. 
uh, the quality of the model is, is going up as the more changes you make uh, and it gets more confident um, based on these parameters, particularly staying about the same, uh, the quality goes up. I think the quality needs to be above uh, 0.5 uh, for the green light uh, to come on. But, you know, as you look at this, and, and you know, the green light's not on here. I'll we'll kind of zoom in here. The green light's not on here with the quality of 0.5, but look at that. I mean, that's, uh, this is, you know, this is very close. Uh, again, uh, worrying about that second significant uh, digit there, I think, is uh, not all that important in, in, in the reality of process control applications and industrial processes. So anyway, uh, we, we did the adaptive tuning there, and so waiting another trigger. Um, uh, but let's uh, let's go on to looking how it responds in different regions. So while that's happening, I'm going to turn off the set point trigger, and uh, we'll go to uh, delta V operate here, and uh, let's go uh, to uh, region five. Uh, so. Get into region five, we're going to need to uh, change the set point uh, to 85%. And uh, since uh, region five has uh, got a steep slope, high process gain, it doesn't take very long to get there. Uh, we can open up uh, the trend chart um, and uh, take a closer look uh, on that. What's going on in lab two? Now uh, here, this is lab one that's open. Let's open up lab two. Since this is a very fast process, we're gonna have to decrease the time span. So uh, I usually click four times and then I'm gonna scroll over to see what's going on. So here we're looking at the secondary process variable <coughs> and its set point and its output. <coughs> and you see with uh, the existing tuning settings, it's doing a pretty good job for this uh, high gain region uh, and that's why you would tune the controller for the worst case, worst case being the highest process gain or the lowest uh, process time constant. In this case, uh, the gain is the issue. So we've tuned the controller for a smooth response for, for the high process gain that occurs due to the steep characteristic of the equal percentage characteristic at high controller outputs. And here, you know, as we're operating up around Gosh, 96% uh, uh, controller output on that uh, on that cyan um, trend of the controller output, which uh, you know we can say is basically the stroke for the control valve if we are ignoring stick slip and, and backlash. So let's make a set point change and uh, see how it uh, goes. Uh, uh, let's go up even uh, higher. Hopefully we won't run out of control though. But uh, due to the very steep part of the curve here, it doesn't have to move that control valve very much to uh, get that new set point, as you can see here. So it's tuned uh, pretty nicely if we're operating here in the worst case of the high process gain. Uh, let's see what happens as we I go down to region one where we're getting on the flat part of the control valve characteristics. So uh, let's take that uh, that set point down to five. Uh, it's going to respond fast in the beginning, but then when we get on the uh, on a relatively flat part of the characteristic, it's going to slow down. Um, and so it may take a while here before it uh, reaches set point. And while that's happening, uh, let's take a closer look at some of these other screens here. Uh, the adaptive control screen is uh, kind of nice uh, because it gives you 
an overview of the regions and where you are at in terms of your operating point. And you can see the controller output is slowly decreasing. And we're going to end up, uh, I think, here in uh, Region 1 with an output that's uh, less than 20%. Uh, I divided up the five regions in controller output equally to be 0 to 20, 20 to 40. 40 to 60, uh, 60 to 80, and 80 to 100. Um, and uh, it, it, it tells you uh, that right now, since we, we're not on adaptive control, it's uh, using uh, the fixed uh, controller tuning settings. And we'll kind of zoom in here and look around. So uh, it, the, the working gain and working reset, uh, since uh, we're not in adaptive mode, is just what was entered into the controller. Um, but if we go to adaptive mode, uh, what we're going to be using is a lambda PI tuning method with a lambda factor uh, 1. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll see uh, what we can do later on when we actually go to adaptive control. Model viewing. Um, this shows the models that we've gotten. We, uh, we've approved models for each region, and uh, we can plot those approved models. And this uh, shows how, again, the process game goes from uh, nearly zero up to uh, something over two. And as so we go on steep part of the uh, bell characteristic up in region five. Let's see how we're doing here. Well, it looks like we finally reached set point. So uh, let's make a change in the set point from, say, 5 to 10% and see uh, what the response is. Well, we already know it's, it's, it's slow. It was slow when it got into, uh, you know, region. <coughs> Actually, we're in the, right now we're in region 2 because the controller output is uh, greater than uh, 20%. Um, so we've moved into region two, but still we're on the relatively flat part of the characteristic and low process game. So the response isn't particularly fast, uh, as we see here. Well, let's look at some uh, other screens here. In learning setup, uh, we have a lot of flexibility to set the triggers in terms of uh, set point and uh, changes in controller output. Um, you can uh, you can delay the identification uh, if, if something's been happening by one minute. You can disable some model filtering in manual if you wanted to, since you have a better idea in manual of what you are doing in terms of disturbances uh, by just creating the, the disturbance yourself, and it's not a function of tuning uh, like it would be if you're trying to adapt based on the set point change. So you may not need the model filtering if you're doing, if you're doing uh, step changes in manual uh, because the identification can be done better. And so you can do it faster by disabling model filtering. <coughs> Again, if you're going to, if you're not going to have set point changes or controller output changes in manual, uh, you can inject one, uh, and that's a pulse, and there can be a waiting period between the pulses and the maximum of change that you make for the peak of the pulse. Well, let's go back and see what the process is doing. Well, it has gotten a set point, but sure, it took a long time. So let's see what the, uh, we can do if we go to the adaptive mode. And uh, we do that here, adaptive control screen. And you have a couple of choices, uh, partial or full. We're going to go to partial because uh, what we want to uh, do is retain the approved models for calculating the controller settings. Whereas if you went to full and you got a good model, then it would say, OK, now I'm going to change uh, the identified dynamics and tuning settings uh, based on uh, this new model because it has enough quality. But we're going to say we're going to go with the approved models. And so uh, we'll be in partial adapt mode. And it says uh, it's good to go. Uh, so 
Uh, if you look again and zoom in here on uh, the uh, working gain and reset, we see now um, it says we should use a controller gain of 1.38, and uh, on the reset time is still at two seconds. But we can see that the controller gain, gosh, is about uh, uh, you know close to being seven times uh, larger. Well, let's see how we do. Uh, let's go to Delta V operate, and we'll make uh, another set point change. And boy, uh, dramatically different speed of response, uh, as expected by the controller being uh, being uh, seven uh, seven times larger. Uh, so uh, we're in good shape there. And uh, uh, let's see how we're going to do, though, in uh, Region 5. So uh, let's go to Delta V Operate. And uh, uh, we're going to check uh, what's uh, going to happen uh, then in uh, Region 5 by taking the set point on up to 85%. Well, with these tuning settings, you're going to get anywhere you want to go real quick. And so uh, here, uh, we'll see that, uh, boy, uh, we've already gotten to set point uh, with the uh, with the partial adapt mode on here, and uh, we find out. And uh, actually, we got there faster than we did with the fixed tuning settings. Uh, so here, uh, let's make a set point change uh, uh, in Region 5 and see uh, how well we do in the partial adapt mode. And boy, doing great. So you can see the advantage uh, for dealing with uh, nonlinearity that's in the control valve offered by the partial adapt mode. And uh, I think uh, with a flow loop, uh, if for some reason the valve characteristic was changing uh, due to uh, changes in operating point in terms of user, other users in the system, changing the available pressure drop, then you might want to go to the full adapt mode. But let's uh, move on to uh, the uh, liquid pressure loop. So uh, let's go to the single loop lab. And I've uh, set this up uh, so that uh, we're like a liquid pressure loop, although maybe not quite as fast as some of them. And uh, I've created the effect of the pump curve by entering gain factors here um, uh, so that we're at, at, at low pressure set points that run a steep part of the, of the pump curve. And then at high pressure set points, uh, we're on, on the flat or low process gain part of, of the pump curve. Go to here. Um, let's go to uh, tuning this loop. So uh, we'll start out like we did with a liquid flow, and we'll do a auto tuning with the on-demand tuner. So we can do a test right now. And uh, like with a liquid flow loop, uh, we get some results very quickly. And uh, like that, the liquid flow, uh, there is a very noticeable oscillation in the process variable due to the small time constant. Uh, and uh, again, uh, I would normally use the uh, Ziegler Nichols closed loop oscillation method, but uh, going with about half uh, 
that factor of the ultimate uh, gain that uh, Ziegler Nichols originally uh, used as uh, their case for maximum disturbance rejection. They didn't have enough robustness. Oops. And then I'm going to enter in uh, recognizing or approaching dead time dominance, uh, a lower factor for uh, the ultimate period. And if we uh, zoom in here, we can see that uh, we come up with a higher controller gain and a higher reset time than what we're working with uh, right now. Well, let's uh, try adaptive tuning. First, we'll check out the learning setup. And yes, we are going to trigger identification based on a set point change of 2% uh, or more. So we'll go to adaptive uh, here. Tuning and uh, make that set point change. And let's see what happens. It's triggered. That's a good sign. Oh, and we should open up uh, the trend recording. Uh, so let's uh, minimize the one. So, Lab we'll 2, and uh, let's look at loop lab 1. And again, this is a fast process, so I'm going to click uh, the decrease uh, time span four times, and we're going to scroll over uh, there with the adaptive tuning, and I'm going to highlight, uh, uh, I'm making bold, uh, the set point PV and controller output that are of interest here. And let's see, we're doing a pretty good job there. And so the response. And uh, we've, we are uh, getting um, the model identified at this point. And if we look at the model viewing, uh, yes, we've got another model. The quality is 0.68%. It shows that we have maybe a little bit higher time constant, the process time constant uh, than maybe originally we thought. And this is due to the fact that I, I've got multiple time constants in there. It's just not a single one. And so it's reflecting that aspect of the dynamics. So uh, let's go ahead and see how we do by going into a different region. And in this case, we're going to go to uh, region 5. And here in uh, region 5, uh, we're going to be on a flat part of, of uh, funk curve. So let's see what happens as we go to a high pressure set point. And it starts out pretty fast, but then it slows down as it gets on, uh, as it starts to approach the flat part of the pump curve. So it's going to take a while. And uh, while that's happening, uh, let's go look at the, uh, at the adaptive control for, for this uh, liquid pressure loop. And uh, we see that, uh, if we zoom in here, uh, we see that uh, the process gain for low pressure set points is uh, up over about, oh, up over three, and uh, is uh, getting uh, close to like 0.2 uh, if we get to the flat part of the pump curve, and, uh, which is the case for the high uh, pressure set points. And we still haven't gotten there, so <laughs> let's go back and we'll look at uh, model viewing. Um, and it uh, shows, well, it should uncheck that uh, since uh, it's made such a change in regions. And I'll uh, delete that model, the extraneous. Um, so uh, we can then check. When you go across many regions all at one time, uh, you're, you may not get a, a good model because what you're seeing as a response is a, a composite of uh, the changes in all the different regions. And so if you're going to do identification, you really ought to be operating in one region or at most uh, going into the adjacent region. Uh, to get really good results. So you shouldn't be trying to cross all five regions uh, like I did right there. Oh, 
it looks like we've gotten there. It just took us a while. And if we make a set point change here, 85%. And look at the response. So we say, well, eh, it's slow. Right. So uh, what we have here would be the, what you would normally see in the field, and that the controller was tuned for the worst case, the high process gain, which occurs for low pressure set points. And therefore, the, the response is sluggish uh, for the high pressures set points where you're on the flat part of uh, pump curve. Well, it looks like we're going to get there. It's just going to take some time. So let's go down to region one where things are faster and do that by uh, lowering the set point significantly. Now, in a real application, you may not want to lower the pressure set point that much because uh, you certainly want to have enough pressure for forward flow, uh, particularly taking into account fluctuations in destination pressure, you wouldn't want to get into a reverse flow. And that's one of the problems with variable speed drives in terms of turn down. If, if you turn down the speed so much in a variable uh, speed pump, uh, the, the, the pressure, the head developed, it gets so low, while you may be okay for a while in terms of forward flow, but you get into, say, a a spike in pressure downstream, say, in a vessel that you're uh, feeding to, and you end up uh, getting reverse flow, which uh, could be catastrophic. I know there's one instance where um, adverse, reverse flow from a, a reactor and uh, actually the catalyst ended up uh, going back. That was in the bed of the reactor, went back through the pump. And, and so in that particular case, uh, company decided not to use uh, variable speed drives and in that process. And it, it tends, when you have a really bad experience, it tends to carry over to the other, uh, other processes in the, in the plant. Anyway, uh, here when we get to region one with a fast response, hey, uh, you know, we're doing okay because that's what it was uh, basically tuned for. And so if we make a set point change here, uh, say from um, <clears throat> 10.15, we're going to see a pretty fast response. Uh, uh, we're okay with the tuning here because uh, uh, this was really uh, what the controller was tuned for because it's the worst case by process gain. All right, well, let's go ahead now and finish this up by uh, putting it in the uh, adaptive mode, and uh, we can do that by uh, switching to partial adapt. And then we'll make a step point change here. Let's see how it does in the partial adapt mode. And it's got a very fast response. In fact, we can make another set point change and then we'll very quickly see what's going on. Well, we're within about uh, four minutes of finishing this demo here. Hopefully you can hang, hang in there with us. Very fast response. So let's see what happens though now if we go up to uh, the other region uh, where uh, we end up uh, with uh, uh, the low process gain, we'll, uh, we'll go to a set point of 80%. Uh, and see if we're going to get a sluggish uh, response up here on the flat part of the, the pump curve. And uh, 
looks pretty good so far, even though we went quite a distance from Region 1 to Region 5. Uh, now, uh, now that we are in Region 5, let's see how well we do there uh, by making a set point change in Region 5 on the flat part of the pump curve. Well, it sure is a lot faster with the uh, adapt control being turned on than what we had before. So that's the demo. And uh, you want to try this out, plus probably a thousand other scenarios. Uh, you can go to the website, uh, Process Control Labs. And uh, you know, this is the home page. Uh, we do have an overview on the screen to uh, show you uh, uh, typically how to use the lab. And uh, we have instructions and how to connect. And then if you decide you want to try this out, you re request access. And you fill out some uh, something that identifies you and you agree to terms of use and you'll be sent an email with the port number uh, and uh, the username and uh, password that will allow you to use uh, one of these uh, 12 virtual plants. Now you, you may have to, if you're doing this within a company, you may have to work with your IT people to, uh, to get uh, permission to, to use remote desktop uh, for the assigned uh, port. Okay, uh, go back uh, to our seminar. All right, thank you very much, Greg, and thank you, everybody, for joining us. And you'll see if you have your Q&A box open, I put this URL in there, and we'd really appreciate you taking a minute to give us your feedback on this. Every um, comment we look at and see what we can do to make future ones better. Okay. And now the next one, join us on June 23rd at 10 a.m. Central Time in the U.S., which is 1300 Universal Time. And the topic's going to be PID tuning for near integrating processes. And Greg subtitled it, How to Reduce the Tuning Time for Column and Vessel Temperature and Pressure Loops by 90%. So that's one you don't want to miss. And today's session will be um, turning it into something and uploading it, and both Greg will be putting it on his modeling and control.com blog, and I'll be putting it on the Emerson Process Experts blog. And with that, I'd like to open up the floor to questions, and we'll keep about a minute of um, dead time uh, space here for any questions to come in. So thanks again for joining us and we look for your questions. Oh, we have a question here from Carrie asking, do VFDs have the same pressure and flow reversal issues when operating to wider flow as to closing down? I think, uh, if I understand the question correctly, uh, 
that it is more of an issue uh, as you're trying to uh, operate uh, at lower flows, and it's more of an issue if uh, the intersection of the system uh, friction curve is on the flatter part of uh, the pump curve. End up with um, actually um, due to the low process gain, a, a low process sensitivity in terms of uh, dealing with disturbances. Uh, you can get into some very erratic flows if uh, it's not you know into the severe situation of a, a flow reversal. Go to uh, higher speeds. Uh, and hopefully then you're also on the steeper part of the pump curve and uh, got uh, uh, the process gain and, and, and sensitivity there to, to react uh, and, and do a good job of, uh, of control. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of variable frequency drives at a, a low speed limit of about 20%, and I also wondered why, because uh, Really, there is no stick slip or backlash going on, but I think it all comes down to this concern about the intersection of the system frictional loss curve, you know, you know curve that describes uh, pressure drops in the system a change in flow, and that intersection of the pump curve. Uh, so if you could do a good analysis and be sure that uh, you are not intersecting on a flat part of the pump curve, if you would be able to lower that low speed limit to uh, less than 20%. Uh, and I know Shinsky has done a study uh, on that and, and showed that you could actually get a very good rangeability of a very good frequency drive. If, if that were the case, and, and the fact that it would be as good as maybe the turndown capability you would get with a uh, magnetic flow unit. So, if you have a nice uh, setup in terms of a pump curve, you could do quite well in terms of turndown, but I think to be safe, uh, the default is I normally set at uh, 20%. All right. Are there any other questions for Greg before we uh, end this session today? All right, everybody, thanks for joining us, and we will see you again on uh, June 23rd. Thank you.